if the people extended their hospitality to sexual relations and the men waited around nine months for their boats to get repaired, they realized that all of the people were not only colored, but all of the babies that came about would be colored babies, President Obama being an example. So I maintain they didn't have to have a big conference hall, big church, <laughs> but they realized if everybody is colored and everybody is genetically dominant, unless we control all of these people, these men might get in boats. and start going from south to north. And maybe at that time they were even aware that the white women said their ideal mate was tall and dark. <laughs> so they realized, I maintain at that point, that white could disappear. That white could disappear on this planet unless they controlled and we all grow up learning. Black people learn this before they learn how to read. If you are black, what class? Get back. If you are brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. And if you're white, you're all right. Now I can say this in London, England, in the audience knows if you're black, get back, brown, stick around, yellow, no. Wherever white people have been where there are colored people, if they stayed around to make a color mix, that people start learning this. But most people don't understand, you just learn. Growing up, if you're black, get back, brown, stick around, yellow, no. These, this is the color code for white genetic survival. The more color you have, the greater your genetic potential to cause white genetic annihilation. Are you following me? So we're taking the mystery out of all of this. But beyond that, see all over, this country, we are looking at a certain dynamic taking place. And I basically say we are on a genocide slide. Do you see that if people, certain people are fearful of the genetic power of another group of people, then they will try consciously and or subconsciously to destroy those people. It's as though they have been labeled a genetic enemy. And so if you went to the prison, you will see more people at this color end than at this color end. Do you follow what I'm saying? Beyond that, men and women may be equal as human beings. See, the audience got quiet. <laughs> what is she going to say? <laughs> Do you see, but it's only men, it's only males who can impose sexual intercourse. Are you following me? See, Sally Hemings didn't rape Thomas Jefferson. You know, if Sally Hemings got a knife out of the kitchen, and threatened to have sex with Thomas Jefferson and he got afraid, what would happen, <laughs> gentlemen? <laughs> See, now I don't know if people, everybody got that lesson in physiology, <laughs> but men know. <laughs> if I got, went to my purse and got a M16 rifle and said to a man, you are gonna have sex, and I frightened him, Gentlemen, what would happen? 
See, an erection cannot be maintained in the presence of fear. That's just fundamental physiology. The creator made it that way. So a man wouldn't be, you know, distracted by pleasure when he needed to run because of fear. So <laughs> women cannot impose sexual intercourse. They can try to entice, influence, but they cannot impose. Ultimate imposition is to get a weapon. So the focus for white genetic survival has to be on the male, and then it has to be on the males who have the greatest genetic potential to cause white genetic annihilation. Are you all following me? So Neely Fuller has told us that we're dealing with a system and the system to maintain the power equation of white power over a relative non-white powerlessness. Now he doesn't say for the purpose of genetic survival, that's Francis Welsing's contribution. Okay, but I say this power equation is the white genetic survival power equation necessity. And the system functions in economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Now we are in a temple called the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Now we can go back in history and the paleontologists and anthropologists are telling us that black people were the parents, the first people. I'm not talking about some higher primate. I'm talking about human beings. Black people are the first people. Black people are the mothers and fathers of everybody on this planet. The first people to know about God. The first people to be mathematicians, architects, scientists, philosophers, to know about astronomy. But when the people who classify themselves as white started taking over, they knew of the critical importance in the area of religion of telling people, the whole world of colored people, that God was white. Now that was, I say, a critically important step. And sometimes I give the people who run white supremacy some grades. They can get A plus. Because <laughs> that was a very strategic move. Do you see, to say, well, wait a minute. It's more of them than us. So first, if we conquer them, then we can brainwash them and have them think that they are the image of God and having the people of color praying to white day and night to love them and to save them. And oh God, why did you make me black? <laughs> I'll just tell you all a little story. When I was very young, and I'm baptized Baptist and christened AME. That's to satisfy both sides of the family. <laughs> My grandfather was deacon, chairman of the deacon and trustee board at Olivet Baptist Church in Chicago for 35 years. So I'm in church, you know, before you can see straight. But I say this was a strategic move in having, you know, your Sunday school every Sunday from the time you can breathe. And I remember 
looking at the Sunday school car. We used to get Sunday school cars with a little picture of Jesus yes. bowing down in Gethsemane, you know. And so I remember in our pantry, you know, a little room with a lot of shelves and food, and it would be a big box of Quaker oats on the bottom big shelf. So I remember going in there one day and just looking at the Quaker oats box, and I said to myself, that must be God, because he just looked like an older Jesus. <laughs> I didn't discuss this with my parents. <laughs> I had just concluded this on my own. Here's Jesus looking young on the Sunday school car, and here's this white man with this long white hair. And I just said, especially since you sang the grace and we thank him for this food, <laughs> this oatmeal, so that had been my conclusion. Let me tell you a secret. Anybody who was taught that this white man was the son of God, their brain computer had already jumped ahead that God had to be white. Do you understand what I'm saying? So whether you were ever questioned about it, given a lecture about it, your brain computer had jumped ahead instantaneously and made the conclusion. But I say that truth is very difficult to hide. It manifests itself, it surfaces, no matter how you try to suppress it. So I said, if we even look at the name Jesus and break it down into Ebonics, then we have just us. <laughs> So while we're waiting for somebody else, it's just us that have to get ourselves together. You see, but I say, if you begin to understand what I'm saying about what racism as white supremacy is not racism and white supremacy. Nearly Fuller informs us racism is white supremacy and white supremacy is racism. And what I'm saying is that we have fought as black people dealing with this problem generation after generation after generation after generation, that it was just a question of, well, white people have to be taught to love. I remember standing in my home being a little girl, just the height of the table. My parents were reading the Chicago Defender, my grandmother was there, and they were kind of whispering about a black man having been lynched. You know, they would talk softly, and then if you were a child, you knew to listen carefully. So I said to my grandmother, well, Granny, why would they do it? And my grandmother said, well, some people just have to act ugly. But beginning to understand what racism is in terms of the demographics and the genetics on the planet, that this is what people who classify themselves as white felt they had to do for their survival. And it is not logical to expect people who designed a system consciously and or subconsciously for their survival to undo that system. Do you understand? That doesn't make sense. And this is what we have been thinking. Dr. Martin Luther King, in all of his genius and in all of his courage, talked about love. Do you see? But if all of the nine-tenths people on the planet, plus the one-tenth white people, if everybody, I'll put this in a heart.